All right, let's just. All right. So, I'm. All right, I'm just gonna have to go right back and start again. Sorry. Okay. okay. Um, just give me a second here. I don't know why it, it froze. I don't know if it my internet's overloaded. It, it just could be copy. Just give me a sec here. This should be connecting now. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, just give me a second here. It's not giving me the option to go live. Uh, Set on shorebirds. Okay. All right. Hopefully this will get us. Can you wave for a second? Just wave to the camera, Jean. Oh, wave. Yes. Yeah. Can you see me? <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna one. That's not. Goodness, I don't know what's going on with this. Zoom meeting, there we go. All right. Can you try giving me a wave again, Jean? Yes. Okay, we're moving again on, on Zoom to, all right, there we go. Okay, we'll try again. I think we'll try again. <laughs> all right. Hi, well, everybody, we... sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. We froze up on you. Um, All can, right. Hopefully everyone can see and hear us now, and we're going to just start from the beginning and, and let Jean continue on. Okay, well, here we go. Good evening, Shorebird enthusiasts. I'm really happy that uh, you've joined me this evening, and um, we're going to be talking about southbound shorebirds. Um, as you know, I love shorebirds, and I hope you do too. Shorebird watching is one of birding's most pleasurable experiences, and we have great opportunities here in Ontario for close observations. This is perfect timing because we are right at the beginning of southbound migration, which goes from now until freeze up. The first southbound migrants are already appearing in southern Ontario. This juvenile Wilson's foul rope will start us on our search for southbound shorebirds. So the program this evening is in four sections. Uh, the first section will talk about shorebird facts, about plumages, molds, aging, and migration, because knowing a little bit about these uh, areas will help us with identification and may even help us find rarities. The second section is about the, will be all about the first southbound migrants from late June to July. Then in the third section, we'll talk about dowager identification, uh, long and short bill dowager, because this is always a challenge. 
And finally, we will uh, talk about southbound migrants from August to Frieza. These adult sandalings are uh, in breeding plumage and they are southbound migrants. So what is a shorebird? Well, it's hard to define, but easy to recognize. There are 52 species on the Ontario checklist with 37 occurring regularly. Like the name shore, shorebird suggests, um, they generally found uh, around shorelines, mud flats, edges of ponds, muddy fields. And so here's just a, a small sample of the some of the groups of shorebirds that we'll be covering this evening. So for plovers, here we have a juvenile black belly plover, and then uh, avocets. Here uh, we have an American avocet. Then on the right hand side, uh, there's a, a, lot, a group called peeps. These are the small sandpipers. And here we have a juvenile leaf sandpiper. Uh, then um, down here, it's a, uh, a short billed dowager, juvenile. In the middle here, we have a redneck phalarope, and there's a, a group, a whole group called phalaropes that we'll be looking at. And then and some medium-sized shorebirds, um, such as this juvenile red knot. So uh, there are three southbound migration waves that are related to breeding biology. Adult females migrate first in most species. Females lay the egg, they incubate, the eggs hatch. The young are precocial, which means they can walk and feed themselves. So the females take off and leave the males to raise the young. And that mostly means uh, watching over them and teaching them how to avoid predators, maybe. Um, in the second wave, um, uh, males, adult males migrate next. So the males stay about another two to three weeks until the young have grown and are fledged, truly fledged, and then they migrate in the second wave. Juveniles migrate last three weeks to a month later. And so um, they stay on or near the breeding grounds to fatten up. And after that, uh, they're ready to come south. So it's the juveniles we'll be seeing later in the season. And I like this map because it's, it's just a, a very simple map that shows uh, where our shorebirds are coming from. Most shorebirds are long distance migrants um, and many leaving high up in the Canadian Arctic and traveling all the way down uh, into, into areas in South America. And so they're migrating on a broad front across the continent. Um, many are heading into Hudson Bay and James Bay and, the, and then maybe even out to the East Coast and down across uh, the Caribbean, the Atlantic and Caribbean and into South America. Some are going through the center of the continent um, and the um, some of the, as you've probably heard, some go, are going to Asia from the, the Western High Arctic and from our Eastern High Arctic are going to Europe. And uh, here's a map of uh, Hudson Bay and James Bay because uh, James Bay, an extension of Hudson Bay here, um, is one of the most important shorebird stopover points in North America. And it's right here on the on the west coast of uh, of James Bay, and as you, many of you know, I've been I was going up for um, many years surveying shorebirds, um, but directly north, it's all directly north of southern Ontario here, and so uh, that helps us get um, the big numbers of shorebirds that we get migrating through our area. All right, and uh, so in order to appreciate and identify shorebirds, recognizing feather tracks is important. So let's start with the scapulas. 
And here on this buff-breasted sandpiper, juvenile buff-breasted, um, the scapulas are these large, uh, dark scented feathers with buffy tips uh, that uh, uh, are draped over the top of the wing. And we talk a lot about scapulas because many, many times scapulas have important patterns. And then uh, the co wing covets are these feathers here uh, that are over the smaller feathers on, on the side of the wing. Uh, the tertials are very important uh, feathers in describing shorebirds. And there are these three large feathers here that sit on, on the wing in, on a folded bird. They are the inner three uh, secondaries. And finally, the primaries, these dark feathers here um, are, are the longest flight feathers, and also they are very important in describing shorebirds. Now, uh, there are three <laughs> ages of feathers. And um, so during the, the shorebird watching season that we will be experiencing, you will see three, uh, or you can see possibly three, three plumages. So we'll start over here on the left side with this uh, um, bright, sort of very well-marked uh, breeding feather on a red knot. So all these photos are of a red knot in various uh, stages. So this is a breeding um, feather of the scapulars. So remember the scapulars are those large feathers. And there you can see uh, the scapulars on a breeding plumaged red knot. The, the middle feather here is the winter, the, in the winter time, shorebirds look totally different. Um, many shades of gray, as it were. So the feather here is uh, are the fe the gray feathers with a dark shaft streak on a winter plumage red knot. And finally, uh, over here, we have the juvenile red knot. And you can see that it's different from the winter feather because it's got the dark subterminal band. So three different types of feathers we could be seeing in, in this presentation. So um, let's start with the, the, the time we're in right now. And I'm going to sh try and show you a chronology of southbound migration, how it ever, it doesn't always quite follow this. So we'll start with the two species that migrate first, lesser yellow legs, and lee sandpipers, or so lee sandpipers first here. Um, so this is um, the lee sandpiper in worn breeding plumage. Uh, it's the smallest sandpiper in the world, and it only breeds in the New World. Um, and it's an early southbound migrant, appearing in southern Ontario at the end of June. And I saw on eBird today um, a lee sandpiper already reported. Okay, so of course the adult females are going to come first. This is an adult in worn breeding plumage. And so when I uh, scroll in here, you can see how uh, worn the edges of many of those feathers are. All right, and um, so here we go. Now, so that we can do our uh, analysis and comparisons, Although the juveniles come a month later than the adults, I'm placing the juveniles right after the adults so that we can do our comparisons. So here's a bright, fresh uh, plumage juvenile least sandpiper. And um, notice just how impeccable all those feathers are. All the edges on them are absolutely perfect that all the feathers came in at the same time so that and there's no wear because they are so fresh and notice the double uh, white line here uh, on on the uh, mantle feathers um so next um in, uh, come or actually this year uh lesser yellow legs that was the first southbound migrant i saw up at matchadash bay where the rough was um a few days ago so um here here we are with um an adult lesser yellow legs 
And now on the, on the yellow legs, the spots have worn off from the, uh, from the earlier breeding plumage. And now it's looking much blotchier on the upper parts and it does have some new uh, winter plumage feathers mixed in. And so about a month from now, maybe even earlier than that, the way it's going, um, the first juvenile lesser yellow legs appear. And just to get like, like the, the juvenile least, it's got that gorgeous spangled fresh look. And it's got nicely uh, edged, beautiful edged tertials here. And again, everything nicely marked and, uh, and new. And I'm going to show you a video now. Oh, Sarah, yes, a video of the juvenile lesser yellow legs. let me know when it's finished because uh, I don't see the screen that you're showing. But you can see how the typical feeding style of the lesser yellow legs. And you're good to go, Jean. Okay, thank you. Next there. All right. And um, now, a ruff is a very rare migrant, usually in July and August. But this one at Machadash Bay, an exquisite male, still sporting its rough and head tufts. You can see it's got a rufous, uh, orangey rufous um, uh, uh, rough and these uh, head tufts, ear tufts uh, still uh, sticking up. And um, so the males molt their ruffs and head tufts early. And so I actually believe that's what's happening here because note on the right hand side, you can see the white bases uh, to the feathers, but this is definitely a treat and a fantastic way to kick off our uh, southbound shorebird migration. Female Wilson's phalaropes move south early from mid June on, and it's very rare to see one in Southern Ontario um, after late June. So after laying the eggs, the females leave and then the males uh, take on incubating and rearing duties. So uh, there we are. And actually up at Machadash Bay, they were still reporting a male Wilson's phalarope. So who knows if it's breeding there. Um, and here is the uh, juvenile uh, Wilson's phalarope. They look like uh, yellow legs. But just take a look again at the lovely fresh edges. And that was our uh, first uh, photo that we, that we looked at. And it's very neat and tidy. And watch for the behavior uh, of darting about after insects. And the second video, Sarah, of you will see the juvenile Wilson's phalarope just stalking insects really cool all right that is a really neat behavior Jean okay thank you all right um kildia adults well everybody's familiar with with kildia they're local breeders uh, everywhere and we may not notice when they leave because ones from farther north will be coming through the more southerly areas and numbers will build up in in some places um, now, juveniles, depending on where you are in Ontario, in the southwest, down at Point Pelee, I still remember seeing them uh, the third week of May, before the long weekend. Uh, however, in the north, maybe they're still sitting on eggs. Who knows? Um, 
And uh, piping plovers also, we have uh, several lo uh, local breeding populations here in, 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 the, in Southern Ontario. Um, and uh, usually the females leave first. However, this was in 2017 on the beach in Toronto, where it was an adult male um, that migrated early and um, possibly um, it, uh, its nest didn't work out. Um, I can't remember exactly the details, but an, an early migrant for sure. Now in July and August, here we are, it's getting warm. Uh, maybe drought is setting in, which could expose more shoreline and uh, more areas for shorebirds to come. And this was Risa Pond up in Markham uh, several years ago in a nice dry year when there was lots of shoreline. Um, so adult greater yellow legs uh, will, will be coming. They're heavily barred, these the adults, worn in worn breeding plumage, really sort of solid looking and much darker looking, but easy to identify when they got the nice barring and, and markings on the belly all the way to the legs. So um, you can see too that the spots are wearing off, worn off on the back. Contrast the previous adult with this fresh juvenile greater yellow legs and uh, all again beautifully marked on the upper parts it's so crisp and fresh you, you just you can't mistake it really and then notice how the bill is slightly shorter on juveniles than on adults but it's got a nice green base and that again will help you identify it and this particular juvenile um, obviously it's genetic where um, they catch small fish, they, they uh, chase around after minnows and that. Um, so if you see one doing that, it's most likely um, a, a, a greater yellow legs. But notice you see that the juvenile doesn't have any of the barring and the marks like on the adult. So they look more like lesser yellow legs, giving us a bit of a, a challenge. Now here's another video coming up and uh, in this one you will see that greater yellow legs have uh, quite a varied diet of uh, food that they catch and in this video um, it's caught a wood frog <laughs> video gene that's just <laughs> and, and just to dragging that frog around like no you can't have my frog to all the other <laughs> birds that were there all right okay and uh it's, it's really easy to identify the two of them when you're uh greatest and lessest when you have them uh both together because of course obviously one is smaller than the other has a shorter um a more narrower bill now, um, solitary sandpipers will be coming uh, back. Actually, I saw, I saw again at Machadash, they were reporting one. This is um, a breeding adult solitary sandpiper in May. Notice that it has spots on the back. And the, so that's in early breeding plumage, first breeding plumage. Now an adult will look much more like this in worn breeding plumage where all the spots or most of the spots have worn off. And so it's just got a very much darker, more solid uh, color on the upper parts. You still know it's a solitary by this lovely uh, eye ring. And here the juveniles look very much like 
the adults in the fresher breeding plumage with lots of spots. But of course, you wouldn't expect an adult to look quite like this when the juvenile solitaries come through. Now, adult spotted sandpipers leave early and they keep their spots until after they migrate. They don't, so they, they if you see a, a, a spotted sandpiper without spots, it's not an adult. That's the rule. We do not see adults in winter plumage. So this is a juvenile spotted sandpiper, um, nicely edged, again, all the even edges on the upper parts. And so here, take a look at the front, uh, no spots. So you know that that's a juvenile. Here we go with uh, the Dowager Challenge. This is a classic um, adult Henderson eye subspecies of short-billed Dowager in full breeding plumage, a ta photo taken in May near Point Pelee. And you notice just how brightly colored um, just all the feathers are, everything is, is beautiful. And um, so an important ID mark is the spotting here uh, in the area in front of the bend in the wing. So in this area, uh, it's very important identification feature. It's one of the easiest to use. Now, when we see Henderson and I short billed dowagers coming through our area in July, they will be in worn breeding plumage, but the still the critical area with spotting is still there. And so you know that they are short billed dowagers. But of course, some of the other marks, you know, the edges on some of the feathers on the upper parts have actually worn off but those spots are still there. Another video, uh, this is, these are, it's about 15 uh, short billed dowagers on a flooded beach in Toronto a, two years ago. All You can see them probing and you, so these, this was in uh, July and it was a marvelous sight to be that close. This is what's so wonderful about shorebirds. They're out in the open and uh, you can, if you creep up and you're very careful, uh, you can get quite close to them. All right. Just wrapping up. All right. Whoops, there we go. All right, so this is a, a, an adult long-billed dowager in breeding plumage, photo taken in May. And the, the easiest, one of the easiest ways to identify them is to look again at that critical area in front of the bend in the wing, uh, where instead of spots on the Henderson eye short-billed dowager, you have these well-formed bars also has got lots of bars on the flanks, heavily spotted across the neck as well. And so uh, long-billed dowagers, the, their plumage wears, the tips of their feathers wear much more than on short-billed dowagers. So this is what a worn breeding adult uh, long-billed dowager can look like in July, where many of the, um, you know, it's, it, just doesn't look uh, as marked as it would have, say, in May. But still, the critical area in front of the wing here, you can see the barring. And here, again, just to show the contrast and the progression with uh, long billed dowagers, Harold Stiver in Ontario took this photo of a long billed dowager. It was in August. And again, you can see the area in front of the wing, everything else is worn off. So you might get fooled into thinking that it's, um, that it's a short bill dowager, but no, you can see the bars right in front of the bend in the wing. And another tip that you have a uh, long bill dowager is that they molt on migration. So um, 
whereas short build dowagers generally you'll be hard pressed to find one uh, that's that's molting in gray winter feathers so that's a, an adult long bill dowager uh, that's already almost fully molted into winter plumage so here's a little quiz for you long or short billed dowagers long build or short build so i hope you're all uh looking this this should be easy this this photo was taken in uh, uh in Ju late july and uh here you look in the front of the wing so you will know that's lots of spotting there spotting and pretty light uh, so short bill dowager those were taken up at risa pond in markham there we go all right now juvenile long bill dowagers they come later than short build and very often they're well, almost always they're molting already into first winter plumage so you can see the gray feathers on the upper parts here interspersed with the juvenile beautiful juvenile uh pretty feathers really pretty those scapulas and but the critical place to look at are the tertials and the tertials are plain they aren't marked they don't have a pattern in them contrast that with a juvenile short bill dowager um, and take a look at the the tertials there they are they're got a very nice pattern often referred to as the tiger stripes so here we've got uh the juvenile short bill dowager just so that you can see the two uh side by side with the uh with the marked tertials and uh the uh juvenile long bill dowager and again notice that the long bill dowager is is uh, is molting video please of a short bill dowager a juvenile uh, just to show its feeding style Okay, that was cool. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, so late July to August, it's nice and warm. Um, maybe we haven't had a lot of rain. Uh, maybe there's drought. Lake levels generally drop at this time of year, leaving lots of habitat for shorebirds. And uh, uh, expect in, in August some adult semi palmated sandpipers. And um, this actually is our most abundant peep and again the adult you can see the mix of gray feathers with breeding feathers uh, so it's already molting and a fresh juvenile absolutely gorgeous um, for identification the, bl the black legs here and um, a bill that is reasonably short and uh, blunt also look at just look at the edges on the feathers all beautifully fresh now uh this is also the time to be looking for rarities like um like western sandpipers and here is an adult uh western now i know this was taken in bc but the same we could get the same plumage here um breed, the, you notice the brightly colored and, and patterned breeding plumage already with winter plumage mixed in the arrow uh, head uh, streaking on the on the sides. And so August is the best time to be looking for juvenile Western sandpipers. And they are a, a bit of a an identification challenge because they look so much like least sand, uh, le sorry, uh, semi palmated sandpipers. Uh, but generally, they, they have um, a red scapula line here, and their bill is longer and more tapered at the tip. 
and here uh, they're also larger. So here we have uh, the Western juvenile Western sandpiper with a juvenile semi-palmated sandpiper. You can see the uh, the difference in the bill lengths right there. Uh, but that's you can't just go on on bill length unless you have a, a bird like this where it, the bill is really long and tapered and um, much you know so way beyond what you'd expect on a semi-palmated uh, sandpiper plus the scapula line the red is right in and around um, all the feathers on that scapula line and the, the the problem too is that western sandpipers have semi-palmations between the toes like semi-palmated sandpipers so you can't use that as an identification mark now adult uh, beards we don't often see them uh, going south because they might migrate farther west and uh, this photo was taken at the end of July. As you notice, it's very worn uh, breeding plumage. And um, so, but notice the, the, um, the, uh, the, how long the wings are. The primary extension goes beyond the tail. And only two of our peeps have this, that's beards and white rumps. And that means that they are super long distance migrants from the Arctic to southern South America. Now, juvenile beard sandpipers are much more common. Uh, we, we get quite a lot of them. So this is a regular migratory route in southern Ontario for them. And um, so that would be about a month later, the end of August, early September, when the fresh juveniles appear. And again, note the, the primary extension here beyond the tail. So you've got three or four primaries extending here and beyond the tertials, these uh, edged feathers here, that's the tertials. So it's important to note also that the, the wings extend beyond the tertials as well as beyond the tail. Okay, this is a video and it shows um, some peeps at one of my favorite uh, shorebird areas, Presque Isle Provincial Park at Owen Point. And you will, you will see uh, just how wonderful it is when you get uh, flocks of small sandpipers on the algae. The algae builds up over the heat of the summer and uh, the more algae you have, the better for the shorebirds. And so they just love all those fly larvae and other insects that are in the that are that are in the algae. I'm already checking my areas for algae. It's always great to see those mixed flocks too, because you get the side by side comparisons. Thank you. All right, so here we have a juvenile buff-breasted sandpiper, and again that gorgeous fresh look. And, and all the feather edges just so neat and, and, uh, and tidy. Is this one of your most wanted uh, regular fall migrant showbirds? It is mine. And uh, so look for them on sod farms and on certain beaches such as at Presque Isle. And now we have another video showing them um, pecking insects off plants. It's just absolutely gorgeous with the, the dove head and the bill and the, the way they, just the, the mannerism, the way they walk around. Could watch them for a long time. So much fun.
just so cool. This is also at Presqu'ile. I, that's always one that I, it's one of my favorites that I wait for every fall at Peely in the Onion Fields just north of the That's park. right, exactly. Yeah, that's a good spot for them. It's the agricultural fields. Stilts, this is a stilt sandpiper in, uh, adult stilt sandpiper, still in breeding plumage and um, very well marked, beautifully marked. While on migration, they, they, change their appearance because they start to molt and on this one here you can see the the gray winter feathers mixing with the uh the the breeding feathers so as as the migration progresses you'll you'll see still sandpipers that are more gray looking and then the juveniles will arrive mid to late august and again that absolute perfect um, neat appearance. Uh, check the length of the bill when you, if you see a sandpiper that's probing like a dowager, bill not quite as long as a dowager, uh, but uh, it, they could very well be. And of course, you know, if you're not sure, get out your field guides or check on the apps, whatever everybody's using these days. S adult pectoral sandpipers, and uh, this is a war adult in worn breeding plumage and they will leave us in their breeding plumage and molt when they get to south america so take a look how different the the juveniles look he, they have rufous these lovely uh rufous edges on the scapulas up here feathers up here um nice white edges on some other feathers and the important thing to check is for rufous edging on the tertials. Here we have an adult, a worn adult uh, behind and a fresh juvenile in front. So you can see the contrast and it's just good if, you, if you're sure to age the shorebirds, you can put that on your eBird list. But you see how rufous the edges are on the, the on the tertials on this particular juvenile right here. Adult semi-palmated plovers are, are easy to identify. They have um, nice old markings, orange base to the bill. Uh, in all plumages, they have a yellow eye ring. And um, so we'll, we'll be getting quite a lot of those. They also have semi-palmations. That's the webbing between the toes. Juvenile, oh, and very worn, this plumage here. You Again, check the plumage and see how worn, if it's really worn, you know it, it's an adult. Uh, the juveniles look totally different. They've got this nice scalloped look on the upper parts, all neat and even, um, but the, the bill is mostly black and uh, the, he the head and neck markings are much more subdued than on an adult. Now, it's important to check all the semi-palmated plovers because you might find a super duper rarity like this common adult, common ring plover uh, that was at Tommy Thompson Park in Toronto in 2016. It looks so much like the semi-palmated plovers, uh, but it lacks the yellow eye ring and the facial markings and the neck collar are really, really bold, much uh, larger and bolder. Plus the white uh, stripe here, flash if you like, is, um, is very prominent. It also doesn't have the uh, true semi-palmations between all the toes, like on a semi-palmated plover. Uh, it has semi-palmations on the inner toe, and the outer toe is that it no the inner the the uh, middle toe and the yes it has semi palmations on one set of toes and not on the other yes and it doesn't have semi palmations on the inner set of toes so you can see it's got a little bit of semi palmations on the middle to the outer toe but it's lacking the semi palmations on the inner toe so you'll have to get out your super optics to check that one out all right so here we go um this 
in late July and August, the north shores of Lake Erie and Ontario are great places to watch southbound shorebirds such as Rock Point, this is on Lake Erie, uh, Presque Isle on Lake Ontario, and the algae mats are developing and so are the flocks of shorebirds. And um, so here we have some sandalings um, and this sandalings tend to stay on the shorelines of the Great Lakes. They're generally not a sewage lagoon or a small pond, although you do get them sometimes, but they like the, the beaches and the, the wide expanses on the, um, on the main large lakes. And so here are adults already starting to molt. You can see uh, some gray feathers coming in. So, and juveniles have a very distinctive look. They, they, they look, they've got this checkerboard uh, pattern on the upper parts, fresh white edges. And again, everything looking uh, spanking new. And so now here we have another video, here we go. And uh, you can see that this is a rather large fish uh, that's washed up and sandalings don't waste any time uh, finding it because it's teeming with flies and all kinds of good things to eat. So video. It's going. Good. <laughs> Great. All right. Those oh, yeah. There it goes. Fish. All right. And so now we're August, September, October. I mean, everything sort of overlaps and, and whatever. And uh, the algae mats are, are building up in many places. So these are where you should be heading if you want to watch shorebirds. All right. So let's uh, talk a little bit about um, the uh, Rufa subspecies of the red knot. It's endangered in Canada and in um, also in Ontario and uh, they, it's listed as well in the United, threatened in the United States. And there's been a major loss of numbers this past spring on Delaware Bay. You're probably aware of that. Um, nobody knows exactly what happened to them. We hope that they made it to the Arctic by a different route. But these are adults in worn breeding plumage on James Bay where about uh, one quarter of the world population of the Rufus subspecies uh, fattens up before undertaking the final leg of their southbound migration to South America. And so the last year that I was up on James Bay, the researchers were uh, tabulating, they were counting all the red knots. Uh, the numbers averaged out all over the two, two, two and a half, yeah, two months to uh, between 10 and 11,000 red knots, which is about 23% of the Rufa population. So, and there's a new article just been published about the stopover ecology of red knots in Southwestern James Bay. And um, maybe Christian Fries is attending this presentation. Amy McDonald is the uh, main uh, author but um, it's a very important paper because it explains how important James Bay is. And um, so end of August and early September, we should be seeing some juvenile red knots and uh, very d different looking from the adults. But And remember that the, the feathers, the gray feathers have that nice uh, dark subterna subterminal band. And here's another video showing red knots uh, on southbound migration feeding on James Bay. Now I wonder, I should have 
told you to look for the juvenile. I meant to do that. Okay. <laughs> How many of you noticed there was a juvenile mixed in there? All right. Okay. So ruddy turnstones are confined to the rocky and sandy shores of the Great Lakes. And um, just beautiful, gorgeous pattern. Uh, they're they're spectac a spectacular uh, shorebird. Now, uh, juvenile ruddy turnstones at the end of August, they look, uh, they look quite different. They will have arrived just about the end of August and into September. And so they're much um, sort of less flashy and showy than, than the adults. But again, you've got that nice, neat, uh, even look to them. And here's another video showing how they use or why they're called turnstones. In this case, it's turning over uh, quite a chunk of bark, getting at the, uh, the uh, invertebrates underneath. That's pretty impressive. Okay, um, so sewage lagoons like this one at Blenheim are uh, excellent, or they can be excellent depending on the, 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 the water levels, excellent for shorebirds. And uh, so just take a look here, you get look in closer at the flock, you identify all the shorebirds, and amongst the yellow legs, lo and behold, is a juvenile willet. That's the large shorebird uh, that right there. And uh, we can get a closer look at it. Um, these juvenile uh, west, it's a juvenile western willet. These are prairie breeding birds and they migrate to the east coast. So uh, they're not super common, but they're regular uh, in small numbers. Many ornithologists believe eastern and western willets constitute separate species. However, the AOS, the American Ornithological Society Checklist Committee chose not to split them in 2017 when there was a proposal to split them. So the proposal did not pass. So that we still have two, uh, we still have one willet, but two subspecies there. And uh, most Dunlin stay close to the breeding grounds um, where they will where they will molt before they come south and um, so they will go to hudson bay and james bay and stage there and we will see them later than that so here that's an that's a full adult up, uh, actually up on james bay and this is a juvenile uh, dunlin we don't see many juvenile dunlins in just about full juvenile plumage in Southern Ontario because they're up on James Bay molting. But this one was in Tommy Thompson Park uh, last summer and it was fantastic to go out and see a rare plumage for us um, on a dun on a juvenile, a ju full juvenile Dunlin. Um, this is what the Dunlin look like when we uh, see them, when most of them come south and um, you notice that they've molted already. They've lost all those nice, um, nice uh, bright juvenile feathers on the upper parts. And this Dunlin here, um, even though they're a, a later migrant, uh, it was on the 15th of December and it was the first record for the Toronto Christmas bird count. So that was neat. Now check very carefully among the Dunlin because that's where you might find a juvenile curlew sandpiper. And uh, this is a rare Eurasian vagrant, that, but they're generally with, with Dunlin. There was one last uh, summer over uh, at Bellwoods Lake and I, Mike Ferguson uh, was with us. We, did a, we were all on the same checklist. So this is Mike's photo of the uh, curlew sandpiper out on the mud flats. The, the, the lake levels were really nice and low. It was fabulous. And sod farms and, and onion fields, Sarah's mentioning, great places to look for golden plovers and um, buff-breasted sandpipers. And check on the sod farms, check 
not only the the um, at the turf where the turf still is, uh, but check where they've cut it off because uh, shorebirds like to get and at the fresh uh, stuff and underneath the sod. And uh, so here we have American golden plovers. Um, they start coming through in August and one of the best places is looking on those sod farms. Adult females first, and um, this is an adult female. They're much blotchier and browner than the males. And then the males have a, a much more, well, they have a solid uh, black in the front, uh, but they still, all of them have that golden look about them and a much narrower, smaller bill than black belly plover and this capped look. They're all overall much smaller. Uh, juveniles arrive in early September. Now the juveniles can be tricky. Um, they're again, compared to black belly plovers. They are, they are golden looking. Uh, they have that capped, oops, sorry, come on here. They have that capped appearance. The bill is smaller and um, the, they, when they fly, they don't have black in the wing pits. Uh, but there is another feature that with, again, with our super optics these days, we can check quite easily is for a hind toe. There is no hind toe. That's the, the little uh, toe that sticks out at the back of the leg. So uh, we'll see a black bellied in a minute. All right, so um, here we have um, adult black belly plovers, uh, a nice adult male, all solid black on the front. And the, here are the black wing pits that I was talking about. Notice I don't call them armpits because birds don't have arms, they have wings. So this is in the pit of the wing and uh, it's a cl ID clincher when you see them. So you know whether you have golden or, or black bellied. Uh, juveniles uh, are spangled and crisply patterned. Um, and here we just, again, there's beautiful intricate markings on them. Uh, and But here you can see the hind toe. It's right there at the back, it's sticking down. And uh, so black bellies have a hind toe. Here is a close up of the legs, black belly plover with a hind toe, American golden plover without. Marble godwits, oh my gosh, I love these birds. Uh, they are uh, probably my favorite show bird of all time. <clears throat> and just look at the gorgeous colors and the beautiful patterns. You can tell it's a juvenile, again, by the crisp uh, look, there's no wear on the feathers and the shorter, shorter bill with a lot of pink at the base. And um, in Ontario, we have the isolated breeding population on the James Bay coast. And, and it's also in the Southeast coast of James Bay in Quebec and on Agamsky Island. And uh, Marble Godwit in flight, look at that beautiful upper wing pattern, uh, very distinctive with the, the dark uh, wing covets right there. And so now we come to another favorite uh, shorebird. It's a wimbrel and uh, it's a war an adult in worn breeding plumage and just look closely at it no juvenile looks like this with all the uh, tatty edges on the feathers and uh, it, they're quite rare in fall they obviously the ones that are breeding um, on the west side of hudson bay overfly us they also breed on the hudson bay coast of ontario uh, but juvenile wimbrel after the middle of August and uh, just to, again take a look at how neat um, all the feathers are again there's no wear. Also uh, the shorter bill and be sure to check the head pattern. Here we're, we're looking at the feathers there and then the head pattern uh, to uh, determine that there is a stripe down the middle. 
I know that some people are still uh, looking for the Eskimo curlew, and the Eskimo curlew head uh, cap was uh, solid. It didn't have that line down it. Now, adult American avocet, and here, take a look for them. They are uncommon but regular in our, in our area. And you can tell by the super wear on the feathers that this is an adult uh, in late August. Um, juveniles. Uh, Holland Landing Sewage Lagoons a couple of years ago, eight Marble, um, eight American avocets uh, set down, and it was quite a sight uh, to see them all and uh, just uh, feeding, actually feeding in unison. It was gorgeous. And here we have another video showing that. But a very distinctive uh, plumage, no question about what you're seeing when you see this. So look at them feeding in unison. It's fantastic how they swish their bill. Very characteristic. Absolutely. And I think it's always neat when you see avocets swimming too. <laughs> yeah. like, like a giant foul rope. <laughs> All right. So there we go. Well, now we do come to the swimming sandpipers. And here we have a juvenile redneck foul rope. And um, these, so these are truly are swimming sandpipers. This redneck phalarope uh, is migrating from the Arctic to the Humboldt current of South America where it will winter at sea. And um, so uh, they, they <laughs> yes, they're, they're amazing. But notice, the, note on this, if you see a phalarope or see a, a swimming shorebird, note the length of the bill and the tapering. Also, the juveniles have this these nice buffy uh, patterned feathers on the upper parts. And so here, uh, later, that, they generally come earlier than red phalaropes. Red phalaropes are quite a, a much later migrant in our area. Uh, this is a first winter red phalarope. Uh, notice that it's already molted all the, the nice upper parts feathers here. So these are the, the first winter gray feathers. Um, the bill is shorter and stouter. It has generally has this orange spot on the lower mandible. And to identify it as a juvenile from the adult, the tertials again are very important. Here they are black or dark centered with nice white uh, edging, whereas on an adult, the, those tertials would be solid gray, the same color as the, all the other winter feathers on the bird. And now we're going to see uh, the red phalarope uh, swimming. Oh, sorry, before we do that, hang on, Sarah. Okay. Um, to look at, the, I talked about them so red phalaropes also are going to spend the, the winter in the southern oceans at sea and they have special feet uh, to enable them to do that and they have lobed feet and then this partial webbing so of course that they can swim you know paddle in the water all right now we have a video all right And this shows the pecking uh, motion, the, the rapid and sudden swimming motions that phalaropes use to assist them in, carry, in catching the invertebrates and other prey that are on top of the water. Nice. Okay. Whoops. There, hang on. Let me go to the next. Woo! I'm trying to go to the <laughs> next slide. Ah, there we go. All right. Adult Hudsonian godwit. Um, this magnificent large shorebird has a, a long bill. This is a male in worn breeding plumage after breeding in August. And um, hundreds of them uh, stage on James Bay. Now, uh, 
they they are vulnerable in they're listed by the committee on the status of endangered wildlife in canada they're vulnerable so they have a listing which means that uh, we they have to be monitored very carefully uh, this is we don't want other birds going the way of the eskimo curlew very important to keep monitoring uh, the uh, populations and trying to mitigate so adult in and here is a juvenile Hudsonian godwit. Looks very different. Um, we get, uh, they're regular but rare in southern Ontario because most of the Hudsonian godwits, well, just about all of them, overfly us and go directly to South America. They may have to put down in bad weather or maybe if they need to top up uh, on food to continue their migration. But that's why we don't, even though there are hundreds on James Bay, we don't see them. And here's another video uh, taken on James Bay showing a group of Hudsonian godwits. You can see that they're molting uh, into winter plumage. And um, it's a fantastic feeding area for them. And see if you, this time, if you can pick out the juvenile. I think I saw it, Jean. Good, good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. All right. So we we're getting close to the end here. Just two more species, and we here we have adult white rump sandpipers um, on on James Bay. We don't see many adult white rumps because they go straight from James Bay over to the East Coast, and from there they take off for South America. Um, but notice the nice long wings again, uh, the, the huge wing extent, whoops, huge wing extension. Ah, we're going the wrong way. And uh, here's one still in full adult uh, breeding plumage. And then again, they start to molt uh, into winter plumage up on James Bay. Uh, this is a molting adult. This is one that we we did see down here. We don't we don't get too many, but Presque Isle is another good place, reliable place to to see one. And uh, and here are the juveniles. We regularly get uh, juvenile white rumps. There's a a full juvenile in the middle here. And um, again, notice the long wing extension like the Baird sandpipers. These birds are migrating a long way. Um, and uh, so we look certainly uh, look forward to seeing them. Uh, they're amongst the last migrants to come through. Uh, but here is the last one. And I don't know, this one is certainly uh, is up in the top of my favorite shorebirds. I don't, maybe you too, uh, because for its toughness, uh, this one, uh, here's a purple sandpiper in first winter plumage. We don't see juvenile purples because they molt into first winter plumage before they migrate south. And so they're, they're actually using the same molt strategy as the Dunlin do. So they, they, they molt near, closer to the breeding grounds. And um, we also don't see adults. We, uh, in fact, Ron Pittaway has, I don't think he's ever seen an adult. It's always these first winter birds. Now, if also, if you look uh, very closely at this one, you'll see that it's got the, a purple sheen and that's a challenge for all of you next uh, November, December, January to go out and photograph a, a first winter purple sandpiper showing the purple sheen that gives this sandpiper its name. And you have to get it in just the right light uh, to do that. But uh, here's a f uh, video now um, just showing how tough they are. They winter farther north than any other sandpiper. We've seen them out in Newfoundland on the uh, that Atlantic 
uh, in January, and um, so they're very, very tough. Uh, ice and all the rest, it doesn't bother them. Anyway, it's a treat to see them, something to look forward to as all the other sandpipers uh, have left us, and we have this uh, treat to look forward to. They're always ones I look forward to seeing. All right, okay. All right, well, here we're at, just at the end of, uh, of the presentation. Um, this was the OFO trip to Long Point um, several years ago, and we're on the beach here near Turkey Point, uh, looking at shorebirds. And um, so these are some of my favorite summer and fall shorebird hotspots. I'm sure you have got, um, got your own. Definitely Point Peely area, Blenheim sewage lagoons, Keith McLean conservation lands, fantastic. Um, with the water levels, there's Perth wetlands, Townsend, anywhere on the Great Lakes shorelines uh, where you've got suitable habitat. So Lake Huron, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, uh, Tommy Thompson Park in Toronto has got a shorebird cell, uh, Hamilton, Windermere Basin, Grimsby wetlands, um, lots of habitat over there. Um, rock jetties, flooded fields, marshes, stormwater ponds, sod farms. So lots of places to look and many of us will be out looking, share your sightings and I hope you have a fabulous time doing it. You're at, I hope you're also up to the challenge and just raring to go. So uh, never bypass the sewage lagoon. Be sure to check the admission uh, requirements uh, before going into a sewage lagoon. But if you can go in, you must go in. Absolutely. And happy shorebirding, everybody. Thank All you very right. much. Well, thank you, Jean. Uh, fantastic presentation as always. Um, I will open the floor up to questions now. Um, so if you have any questions for Jean, just type them into the chat and I'll relay them to her. Um, uh, we're getting lots of people saying how fantastic it was. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and I'll also say at this point in time, while well, you might be putting a question together, <coughs> this presentation has been recorded it will be on our Facebook page. So if you wanna go back and review anything, you can do that. I think that's one of the nice parts about this is you may think, oh, I can't remember what Jean said about this. You can rewind and go back and see that. Um, it's also gonna be up on our YouTube page as well. So there's lots of opportunity to rewatch if you want to. Um, just saying lots of thank yous, Jean. Um, oh, good. Good, well, that's nice to know. <laughs> I'm glad you, <laughs> glad right. you enjoyed it. Well, you, want you know I always enjoy it, um, and I just love when you bring the video into the presentations as well. I think with shorebirds, especially since some of them have such unique behaviors and getting to see how they move can really help you pick them out when you're in the field as well. So, All right. So that's okay. Is it fair to say that Purple Sandpiper is showing up every winter at Tommy Thompson? It's that's a question. It's just about every winter. Yeah. I think they're pretty regular. They, there's good habitat. The rocks out there are covered in algae. So that's, that's a, a clue. They seem to like that spot. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and there, then there are a lot of birders looking for them. So that helps too. Yeah. Yeah. I found too, like around Peely, we've, we've seen them occasionally on the tip uh, at the park, but also um, where I've seen them often is in, on the rock jetty by Wheatley Harbor because it's covered. It's it's a great spot. You can see turnstones there and also yeah. Um, yeah. somebody said, will shorebird IDing ever be easy and, and laughing? <laughs> okay. and said, if it were easy, it wouldn't be fun. Right. This, is, this is the fun of it and it stretches you. It stretches, it stretches you to go out and look and it challenges you and instead of just going out and ticking birds and oh yeah another list this is you tend to study them more and yeah. enjoy the way they move so yeah 
Well, and I, and as you said before too, they're out in the open, so it's it's a bird that even though they are a little tougher to ID, at least they're not hiding in grass or under May apples in the spring. Yeah. Like they're out in the open, so you have lots of time. You can take your time with them, and I think. Jean's given you some really great places like where to look on the bird for clues as to what it is. And I think the other thing that's great about it too is because you can take the time, you can take pictures, you can take video, you can take notes, and if you can't figure it out in the field, you can take all of that home and do some more studying at home. And you know, that's the beauty of birding is that there's always more to learn. And I think we're learning more and more about shorebirds. Um, you know, like in the last 20 years, I think we know more about shorebirds than we did before. And and that's exciting news too, so. Oh, uh, somebody's waiting for, um, hoping for more mud flats in their wetland in Torrey Hill, Ontario, so. Oh, good. <laughs> and, and Jeff Harrison said, this is one of the best presentations I've ever seen. Who said that? Jeff Harrison. Oh, Jeff, oh, I really like you. <laughs> Thank you so very much. photos and videos, thank you, Jean. And I, I agree, this is, um, oh, somebody's asking is, are inland lakes as productive as the Great Lakes shorelines? Um, inland lakes by, uh, if you mean on the, sh on the shield, not, I, I think not really. I, I tend to go to the, the well-known places and um, I, it, I guess it would depend. Uh, if you have a, a sort of a lake with, with muddy edges, the shorebirds could be attracted to that. But if it's, um, you know, the barrens and that, I, I think not, I don't know, it just depends. All right, I'm gonna say, ask, put one last uh, offer for questions out there. Um, if there's any more last minute questions before we wrap up completely for the evening, um, we will uh, just give people a couple seconds more to ask That's some questions. Great. If you have questions at a later time, just send them to OFO. Um, either send us a message on our Facebook page or send us an email to the general OFO email box and we'll get them to Jean and get them answered for you. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're out there. We want to be a resource. And and the other thing is, we, shorebirds need our love and attention. <laughs> and uh, because they're long distance migrants, they face all kinds of challenges. Um, and so uh, they need, they may need a lot of our help later on. So, or even now, so yeah. Well, even and, something as simple as recording your observations in eBird can be a really big help for the people who are doing research on shorebirds um, because they can see where birds are, are on their migration and the numbers. And I know they're using that data to help figure out the conservation status for a lot of these birds. So be sure to get that information in, into eBird and share it um, as much as you can. Yeah, all it right. also helps identify uh, hot, shorebird hotspots and maybe areas that aren't under conservation right now, but uh, could be could be protected later on. So yeah, it's important to document. Yeah, and even things enjoy. And I, I remember, you know, a couple of, a few years back, um, there's a, a canning plant um, north of Leamington that always has a big flooded field every year, and someone just went and talked to them and and. Um, now they know how important that is and they make sure like if it's wet they they don't try and make it dry is <laughs> so they they recognize that it's an important spot and it staying wet has it's no skin off of their noses at, at that time of year so just simple little things like that and recording all those observations can change these um oh somebody is asking about there's a big inland marsh newly created by um ncc on Peely Island. We're expecting to see more shorebirds there. Please come to the island and give me a chance to learn about shorebirds. This is all my weak point. I will appreciate it. So this is from someone who's one of the um, banders. Oh, sounds good. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm just, you get some shorebirds out there. Jean will come. 
Yeah, right. Yeah. Just twist her rubber arm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, take care. well we're going to uh, log off for the evening. Thank you, thank everyone, you. for coming. And thank you, Jean, for another fantastic presentation. And, you know, stay tuned. We've got more uh, presentations coming up. Um, and we're, you know, uh, we'll have them up on our Facebook page as soon as they're scheduled and, and on the OFO webpage. So thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. All right, we're off. <laughs> we're off. Oh, good. Oh, all right. I was just about to.